Good morning and a very warm welcome to this online event on microplastics pollution, risks, occurrences and the case of synthetic textiles, organised by the European Commission under the auspices of EU Green Week 2021 with its overarching theme of zero pollution for healthier people and planet. My name is Jackie Davis and I'll have the privilege of moderating our entirely interactive discussion today with some questions from me to our distinguished panellists who I'll introduce uh, in a moment and I hope also from all of you. We're also going to do a little bit of audience voting later so let me tell you how that works before we get underway. Way. Um, if you want to ask a question or vote on one of the polling questions, you do this via Slido. Some of you may have already used this in opening sessions yesterday. You go to uh, Slido, slide.do, enter the event code, hashtag EU Green Week 2021, click on this session, and then the yes. use the oh. Q, Q and A button uh, to, hang on a second. OK, sorry, we had some interruption there, but I'm sure uh, it may be our last speaker joining us there. Anyway, so you click on the Q&A button in Slido to write your questions. Can I ask you, please, to be as brief as possible so I know what it is you want to know and who your question is for at a glance? And you click on the polls button later uh, to vote on the poll questions that I'm going to ask you. So in this session, the first public event organized by the European Commission's Directorate General for the Environment on Microplastics since the announcement of an action to address this priority issue for the Commission in the new Circular Economy Action Plan adopted last year. We're going to focus on unintentionally released microplastics and discuss what is the scale of the challenge and the risks it poses what needs to be done to tackle it. And we're going to have a particular focus on one of the largest sources of unintentionally released microplastics, synthetic textiles. Let me introduce our panel uh, joining me here today to discuss this. Uh, delighted to welcome Professor Richard Thompson, marine biologist and director of the Marine Institute in the University of Plymouth. Elena Butzi, who is policy analyst at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Frédéric Montgaudin, who is senior marine litter policy officer at Seas at Risk, Rethink Plastic Alliance. And hopefully joining us shortly, Mauro Scaglia, who is director for sustainable businesses in the European apparel and textiles industry, Eurotext. Uh, but before I launch the debate, I wanted to get your views uh, on the issues we'll discuss. And I'm going to launch those polls, give you a little bit of time to answer the question, and then we will move on. So just a reminder, you should be in Slido. You should have put in uh, for the event code, hashtag EU Green Week 2021. Click on microplastics and you will see at the top of your screen on the right polls. That is where the questions appear. So let me give you uh, our first question. And our first question that I would like you to answer today is what do you believe would be the most effective measures to address microplastics from textiles? Do you think it is the eco design of products? Is it the labeling of products according to their level of microplastics release? Manufacturing processes, filters or technical solutions to washing machines and tumble dryers? or increasing capture technologies in wastewater uh, treatment plants. So the most effective, uh, I realize you probably want to say all of the above, but which of these for you is the most important? And this is something we're going to be discussing uh, with our panel uh, in a little while. And as I say, focusing very much here on that unintended uh, release. Um, so I'll just remind you while you're voting of those questions, is it the options that you have? What do you think is the, would be the most effective measures? Should we focus on eco-design, labeling, manufacturing, filters and technical solutions to washing machines, tumble dryers, and in, or increasing capture technologies in waste water treatment plants. Very much they're looking at that whole life cycle, um, which is key to addressing this issue. So I wanted to give you a little bit of time uh, to vote on that, but I think hopefully you have made your choices uh, by now so we can move on to our second question today. And that's what do we need to do? 
in our second question, we want to focus on who needs to do it. Um, so if we can just move and display our second question here, as I say, the focus is on who needs to do what to address this issue. Who do you see as the most important actor in this process for you? And I'm just waiting for it to appear so you can see it as I read it, but hopefully it will do so in a minute. So for you, is the most important actor in this process, are they the EU policymakers? This event organised, of course, by the Commission. Uh, is it them? Is it member state policymaking? So policymaking at the national level. Is it voluntary measures by industry? Is it civil society, researchers? Key role to play here. We have an NGO on the panel. Um, is it them? Do you think they have the most important role to play? Or is it someone we haven't mentioned in this list? So key question, as I said, we talked about the what, this is the who, uh, and we'll talk more about the how as well during our panel. So is it EU level policymakers, national level policymakers, voluntary measures by industry, civil society and researchers, or others who we have not mentioned. And these are all questions that I'm going to discuss with our panel. So what I'm going to do is um, in a moment, we will close the voting. Um, and then I will not look at the results now. I'd like to introduce uh, our panel again and dive straight into the conversation with them. I want to ask each of them an opening question. Then we'll look at the poll results. And then after that, we will continue with our discussion. So panel, I may ask you how you voted on those questions. So beware, be warned. Uh, so um, I think we can now uh, probably close that voting. Enough of you should have had time to vote. And as I say, we will look at the results in a little while. In the meantime, uh, let us dive straight in. And let me first turn, as I said, to Professor Richard Thompson, marine biologist and director of the Marine Institute at the University of Plymouth. And Richard, um, the evidence that we have, the evidence we see, and seems to point to an uncontrolled... Ah, we just lost him just at the crucial moment there. Uh, I don't know whether we've lost his camera or we've lost him entirely. Richard, can you hear me? No, that is the joys, ladies and gentlemen, of the webinar world. Hopefully, Richard uh, will join us again in a moment. But Eleanor, perhaps I could turn to you in the meantime and just say, in terms of the key trends in microplastics, and we're looking here at OECD countries versus non-OECD countries, what do we see in terms of trends and what sort of policy actions are being taken in different countries um, to address this issue? Thank you for the question, Jakey. Good morning to everyone and thank you for having me here. Um, was to answer your question, I think, uh, you know, first of all, we have to start from the point that researchers and academia are telling us that microplastics pollution and in general plastics pollution is a very pervasive and, and widespread issue. Um, if we look at geographical trends uh, in terms of the contribution to microplastics pollution, what we see is that even though the majority of leakage of plastics waste occurs in non-OECD countries, recent studies and modeling uh, actually indicate that OECD countries contribute quite substantially to the release of microplastics into the environment. So in response to emerging evidence on microplastics pollution and evidence on the role of OECD countries as well um, to this pollution, um, we have seen interest from policymakers in finding solutions to this problem. And we have also seen some policy action occurring in several OECD countries, notably via restrictions on intentionally added microplastics. Mm. But where we have seen relatively less action so far is really on my microplastics unintentionally released during the use phase of products, notably synthetic microfibers from textiles and microplastics from uh, tire wear. This is an emerging policy issue. It's a complex uh, issue, which is difficult to address. And, and this is where um, policymakers want to take more ambitious action and are engaging with industry and researchers to find solutions and, and looking at looking for guidance on policy measures, which they have at their disposal. 
Uh, thank you very much. As you say, that difference between the approach on intentionally released and, of course, the EU uh, and the Commission taking action already on this via the reach restriction proposal, but much less on unintentional and therefore this focus today, uh, very important issue. Uh, Frédéric, in terms of, so that's the situation, that's what people are doing. Why should we be worried about microplastics? What do we know so far about the impact that they're having and the consequences if we don't act? Well, I'm not sure we need to be worried, provided we decide to act on it and to act timely. So this is exactly why I'm so happy to see people discuss it at EU level now. Uh, this topic has been in the works in the research world for uh, like 10, 10 years now. Uh, and in the last two years, there have been a massive amount of studies showing uh, the scale of the pollution. Um, so what we know is plastic is everywhere in our lives. Uh, it's affecting human health, potentially. We are still investigating to which level it is affecting on our health. But what is sure is that we are eating plastic. It's in our meat, it's in our water, it's in uh, our fish, of course. And uh, our main concern from the NGO world is really going to the ecological impacts, environmental impacts, because these impacts only would justify political action. Um, they've been shown to be uh, completely widespread. You can find uh, microplastics everywhere in biota. So in the marine environment, uh, it is absolutely in every ocean compartment. And uh, also the impacts are quite diverse. You have chemical impacts that are linked to the additives uh, embedded in the plastics, but you can also have uh, plastics acting as a magnet and absorbing other pollutants from the water, uh, which means then um, marine life eating up this plastic is going to be contaminated. And the scale is scary. Like uh, if you look at hotspots like estuaries, uh, where you have a lot of juvenile fish, a lot of plankton, meeting the water from the fresh water uh, and there in these biodiversity hotspots uh, you have 80 percent of the juvenile fish that is contaminated with microplastics and you have a uh, hundred percent so all the plankton that is in there is contaminated so this is deeply concerning to us and especially the conjunction so having these biodiversity hotspots at the same place as the plastic hotspots and microplastic mm -hmm. hotspots is concerning. So we have them in the deep sea sediments. Uh, we have them, as I said, in the estuaries, yeah. but, but also in many other biodiversity hotspots like the mangroves and in European waters, you also have mangroves. So okay. we have Thank you very much. Um, I think we haven't uh, managed yet to get Richard back uh, and Maro is not with us. I'm sure these things will come. But can I suggest then perhaps could we have a look uh, at the result of the audience polling just so we can see how you will respond on their questions and then uh, we will continue our discussion. And, and to Eleanor and Frederic, I don't know whether you did vote, uh, but I'd be interested to know how you would have voted uh, if you did. So uh, if it's possible, can we have a look at the answers to the first question that I asked, which was, what do you believe would be the most effective measures to address microplastics from textiles? I gave you several options, eco design, labeling, uh, manufacturing processes, filters and technical solutions, or increased capture technologies in waste water treatment plants. And by some margin, uh, eco design of products uh, came out 63%, two thirds of you uh, picking eco design of products as the crucial thing. So when we talk about that life cycle approach, uh, do it from the start. Manufacturing process is coming in second place, followed by filters and technical solutions, increasing capture technologies also uh, in the same place. Interestingly, labeling. Uh, according to the level of microplastics use, does not seem, uh, has found no votes as the most effective measure, um, which suggests maybe the public, there is a sense among our audience, at least the public isn't aware enough of this issue for it to make a difference through labelling. But we can come back, see what you think about that a bit later on. If we could take a look 
at our second question. So that was the what, as I said, then I asked you who needed to do what. And I asked you to tell me who you see as the most important actor in this process. Uh, and we talked about, was it the EU level? Was it the national level, national policymakers? Was it industry, voluntary measures by the industry? Was it NGOs, civil society, researchers, or was it a group that we have not mentioned? So if it's possible, let's have a look at the results of the voting on that question. Um, just give it a second. Um, and then, as I say, I will come back and discuss these things with you. And just to the organisers, if you have any word on whether uh, Richard is going to be able to rejoin us or not, if you could send me a quick note, that would be helpful. Um, so can we have a look at that second, the results of that second question? So here we are again, very, very clear winner, as it were, uh, and it's the EU level that people point to as the key place. 63% of you two thirds picking that, 16% the member states, but 16% is the same number who think we need that action at national level, also see we need action at industry level. 5%, sorry, Frederic, 5% think civil society, the most important actors, but I did ask about the most important actor. I think you will, we will all agree, we'll talk about this later, how you all need to work together to address these issues uh, and other 0%, which suggests we gave you the right options, which is a relief. Um, so let us uh, continue uh, with our discussion and thank you very much uh, for voting. Um, we have no news of our other speakers, so we will carry on. Um, just in terms of what we need to do. So the audience there, Eleanor, was talking about, they think the most effective measures, and particularly this focus on unintentional release from textiles, uh, eco-design of products picked by two thirds of the audience. Which did you go for, or would you have if you voted? Uh, what do you see as, as the most effective things that we can do? Yes, I think if we're talking about the most Effective, effective measure to address microplastics from textiles. You know, there probably isn't a magic solution, a one size fits all um, solution to the problem. In general, measures will need to depend on the product groups that we're talking about and the existing policy framework that you already have in place. Mm -hmm. And also, it's unlikely that acting only at one life, life cycle stage will be sufficient. In general, you will need a combination of interventions along the life cycle of products. So that can include design and manufacturing use and end of pipe, such as via uh, improved wastewater treatment. Um, having said this, we know that measures which reduce pollution at source are likely to be most cost effective. So we want to intervene as close to the source of emission as possible. Um, so I, I, I see why the, the, the public uh, and the participants went for uh, eco-design. It's very important that we work with industry to uh, encourage and incentivize them to um, produce products which simply shed less microplastics. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also very important to also act at the use phase because so far that's where most of their research has focused on best practices and technologies which can uh, reduce uh, the emission of microfibers during use. So I think you need both. Um, and, and in terms of policy measures, um, which you have at your disposal to um, prevent pollution in the first place, you have many options. You can implement certification schemes um, for um, to give information on the tendency of products to shed microplastics. You can implement uh, minimum standards uh, to restrict the worst performing textile products from being on, sold on the market and consequently to incentivize producers to implement eco-design manufacturing uh, practices and technologies. Come, back on, the, come yeah. back on that issue of incentives, if we might, and how you might restrict these products in a moment. But Frederick, in this broad sense of, of the most effective measures, and Eleanor, they're very much endorsing that life cycle approach and saying, yes, she understands why the audience focused on eco-design but it is the use phase as well. And so things like the filters and technical solutions, and I see already a comment uh, from the audience about washing machine fluff filters and saying, uh, you know, we need to address this issue. Uh, there is a question 
question directly to the Commission. We don't have a Commission speaker on this panel because the Commission wanted to listen to your views today, uh, but clearly a concern. How did you answer that question? Which did you pick and why? I picked the first one, so eco-design, because in my mind, uh, you need to act upstream and you need to stop the pollution at source. Uh, of course, I completely agree with Elena that you also need um, down the pipe uh, solutions to make sure, you know, by complementary measure, you reduce the most of the pollution. Uh, but so far, uh, we are really targeting eco-design in our recommendation, especially about textiles, uh, because we realize that most of the environmental impacts that take place during uh, the life cycle of textile uh, are taking place during the production stages and the early stages mm -hmm. of the of the use. Uh, so like the first washes are crucial, and that is why we are uh, discussing filters, um, but putting the <clears throat> the responsibility on, on consumers is a problem because consumers alone uh, don't have the power to, to cut the tap. So we really need to, to look at the pollution on a more global uh, uh, picture and, and evolving uh, production uh, from the start or evolving all the, the manufacturers uh, in, new, in a transition towards, towards new uh, processes. And it's very easy for textile to look into uh, the processes that are in place and that are contributing to the shedding. Uh, it's also very easy to phase out part of the responsible microfibers because some uh, products, some, some fibers are better than others uh, in, in preventing the shedding uh, during use. So I think you can act very early on. And you now have a lot of NGOs uh, reflecting on textile uh, manufacturing techniques. Uh, so not only producers are doing uh, voluntary action, but NGOs are uh, really scrutinizing the process and trying to find solutions. Thank you. And just, just to take up a factual question uh, from the audience, uh, asking, and, and Frederick, you were talking about the occurrence, the risk, where, where we find this. Um, and it, the questioner says, aren't, isn't tire abrasion a bigger problem compared to textiles? When we look at these key sources, uh, plastic pellets being another one, um, what's the, do we, how much do we know about the relative contribution of tire abrasion versus uh, textiles? Can you help us there? Yeah, there, there is a very recent study that has been published by uh, the Galway Mayo Institute of Technology in Ireland, and it's kind of a meta study. So they are looking at all the pollution sources, and uh, according to the region where you are in the in the world, you have different proportions. So what you will find in Europe is actually showing tire wear much bigger uh, contributor to microplastic pollution compared to textile, which is coming second. Um, but in other parts of the world, like in Asia, textile uh, would be the, the first contributor. So mm. we, we need to act globally. We, we need to make sure the European legislation also has an influence worldwide. So it's very important to align uh, measures and to go across sectors. Thank you very much. Um, just coming back to the point, and Eleanor, you were talking earlier about the policy actions being taken in different countries around the world, and you said quite a lot of focus on the intentional, much less so far on the unintentional. Do you believe that in order to address this need, this issue, we need new EU legislation in this area, you know, to do it comprehensively? Or can we use existing measures? Because there are a number of uh, areas where specific legislation touches on this issue, uh, but no specific legislation. Uh, we see talk in the Circular Economy Action Plan of developing going back to the point I asked the audience about, labelling, standardisation, certification and so on. We see them talking about uh, harmonising methods for measuring them, uh, closing gaps in scientific knowledge. Do you think this needs a new legislative framework or do we just need to focus on using what we've got better? Yes, uh, good question. Um, I think you probably need both. Uh, and let me explain what I mean by that. Um, as I was saying earlier, uh, you know, the unintentional release of microplastics from products is a very complex and, and pervasive issue. It's complex to address because from a technological perspective, you have no simple solution to it, no simple uh, way to simply avoid the operation of products um, during use and to, to avoid completely the release of microplastics. Um, 
Um, on the other hand, when you look at the technologies and best practices which can be implemented to at least mitigate releases into the environment, you see that these could not only bring benefits in terms of microplastics mitigation, but also contribute to achieving other pre-existing environmental and climate objectives. So, for instance, if you look at textiles, very roughly, very in general, if you are improving the quality of textile products, you are not only reducing their tendency to shed microplastics, but also extending their lifetime overall. So uh, creating additional environmental benefits and reducing the need for the production of new textiles and the environmental impacts associated with that. Similar reasoning goes for the uptake of best practices for the washing of textile products, such as washing less frequently or, or at lower temperature temperatures. So from a policy perspective, what that means is that if you identify and value those co-benefits across different policy objectives, you can really make big gains at a relatively low cost, including by exploiting legislation which is already existing. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's also very good that you have an holistic vision and strategy which is specific to uh, microplastics mitigation that's useful to set the objectives, to understand where intervention is most cost effective and to, to ensure that you're tackling everything that needs to be tackled. Thank you very much. Richard, you're back. Good to yes, see you. I'm sorry about that. The, the connection just disappeared, so I, I, I had to relocate, but I think that's all now. We're delighted to see you uh, wherever you are. And thank you for joining us again. Richard, we have been talking about the extent of the problem, the, the, the scale of it, what the challenge is, uh, the audience. I asked the audience about the most effective measures uh, to address this issue, particularly in relation to textiles. Most of them chose eco-design, uh, two thirds of them as the most effective uh, with other issues like labeling and manufacturing and so on, uh, filters and technicals are coming behind that. And on the who needs to do what, most people saw it as something for the EU level. Uh, national policymakers and industry got equal footing, but much lower, two thirds said policymakers. That just brings you up to speed on where Thank we you. are. So I want, I want to ask you two questions really. First, for you, uh, a question I asked uh, Frederick and Elena at the beginning about why is it so important to address this issue? Um, and for you, uh, the question we were just discussing, um, do we need a new legislation specific? Because we've heard from Eleanor earlier, a lot of action on intentional release, not so much on unintentional. This is something the Commission now focusing on and we're focusing on today. Does this require new legislation, new tools, or to use what we've got, scattered though it may be, more effectively? And Mauro, before I let you answer, Mauro, a very warm welcome to you as well. We are complete. Uh, delighted to have you here. I'll come to you in a moment, Mauro, but Richard first, while we've got you and before we lose the connection uh -huh. again. Uh, so the, really the scale of the challenge and in broad terms, what we need to do. The, well, the scale of the challenge, I mean, it's clearly absolutely global. We're finding microplastics, including fibres from textiles from the deep sea through to the Antarctic. They're one of the most abundant kinds of microplastic that are found. And I, I say that, but, you know, it's important we don't lose track of the other sources of microplastics, but our focus this morning is, is mainly on textiles. And I think, you know, to me, what's already been shown is that those of us that are lucky enough to be connected to wastewater treatment, that's quite effective at screening out microplastics and fibres. But the question is then, what do you do with the material that you've captured? In many places, it's returned to the land as a kind of fertiliser. Uh, and But on the same token, we also know that even a, a, a small range of different garments, if we wash them, have a very different rate of emission to to the wastewater. Um, so different types of garment design, fibre design, could potentially release reduce emissions by maybe 80%. And the interesting thing there is, of course, that um, we also know now that around about half of all the emissions to the environment come not while you're washing the clothes, but while you're walking around it. And so anything we do with filtration is never going to address that that part that is still entering the environment. And so to me, you know, the logical place to start and to me, it has to be the logical place to start with all of our efforts to reduce plastic pollution is from the design stage. So we're designing products to bring life in service, but we're designing them to during that life in service have minimal emissions, the fibers while you're wearing the clothes or washing them. And at the end of life, 
we've considered what that end of life might look like in terms of a circular economy. I mean, unless we start this at the design stage, I don't really see that we've got a lot of hope of achieving our objectives. And it seems to me that that, you know, has to rely on new legislation. We can't we can't expect industry to do that voluntarily, I think, because the argument is always, well, it doesn't create a level playing field, that there'll be a competitor coming from another nation, perhaps outside the EU, that will be selling goods on our, in our marketplace at a lower cost because they haven't, uh, they, they haven't done the same thing voluntarily. So I think we're going to need legislation and I think it should address the design stage. It's not to say the other stages aren't important, but I think unless you start at the design stage, uh, you're not really maximising your chances of success. Thank you. And we will come back on that. And, and Mara, I'll give you a chance to comment on that, but I want to ask you something else first. Just to say a lot of comments and questions coming in about this precise point about disposal. Um, we have someone saying, where should the collected fibres be disposed properly to prevent their spreading into the environment? Uh, I yeah. mentioned a question earlier about fluff filters, washing machine fluff filters, uh, and do filters on washing machines need to be cleaned? Who should do it? And what are the risks they're cleaned in the sink? Uh, so, you know, you, 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 t you tackle one problem, you create another. So lots of issues relating to that, very much echoing what you said. But Mauro, very warm welcome. Uh, thanks for being with us. I will give you a chance to talk about the legislation question in a moment. But Richard talked there about you can't expect industry to do it voluntarily. But could you give us a sense from the textile sector what you are doing uh, as an industry to tackle this and what plans are in the pipeline? With pleasure. Thank you, Jackie. And really apologies for um, a little bit of delay in this joining you. Um, we have started working on the microplastic pollution issue, unintentional release from Washington Synthetic Textile more than three years ago. We're now very pleased that a harmonized test method is about to be delivered. It has been worked out by the European Committee for Sanitation, CEN. And this has been possible thanks through a cooperation between our industry value chain, different other value chain from um, detergent value chain I, with other association, uh, which we pull together researchers from across the globe. I think that's the first message, researchers across the globe. We work together on voluntary basis. Researchers pay their own tickets to fly to Brussels or Munich or whatever we met. We have a discussion how a harmonized test method has to be made. This has been done after more than two years um, because researchers had to go with their own speed at their own time. The task method is now, as I said, being finalized under SEN, which normally has a long time to deliver a task method, a harmonized task method, as we all know, but has been tremendously shortened thanks to a voluntary initiative by the industry. And I think here we can get some credit for that. Now, this is the first step. The next step is to do research on possible solution. I agree with several points I just heard from Richard. I'm sorry, I could not hear the previous comments before he spoke. Um, it has to be research because there are, we hear about potential solution every other six months. Richard even mentioned airborne microplastic, if I understand correctly. I mean, one year ago, they were not even talking about that. Then all of a sudden, they said, oh, it's not just washing, it's also a side of things. So we will go and find two steps backwards every time we go one step frontwards um, in a difficult moment, difficult, I mean, in uncertain moments. That's why we need research. That's why as a cross industry agreement, we focus on 25 researchers from across the world before we came out with our opposition paper. We haven't made any, we need to learn first. So um, industry has been launching this cooperation with research on voluntary basis. This is now being finalized. The next step is to finance research at production level, at design level. That's what we need to look for. Okay, can I just ask you, Mara, there is a, a comment from somebody here, are industry hindering progress on legislation publishing on their own research? So a question mark saying, well, if the fund, I think what he, what he means is, if industry is financing and supporting this research, um, how credible is it? But on this broader question of the legislation, when I asked our audience, who's the most important actor in this process, two thirds of them said EU policymakers, only 16% said national policy makers and the same number said voluntary measures by industry. Do you believe that we have the right framework in place legislatively? Uh, although it's scattered, there isn't one unified comprehensive approach on unintentional release. Uh, do you, or do you think we need more? Going to Richard's point about, he said, we can't expect industry to do it voluntarily. The incentive has to come 
from the legislation and, and this whole question of the incentives for your members, because there aren't really any at the moment from a commercial point of view, are there? Well, you touched upon many different points. Um, so what is your main question? Is Do we need the legislation? My question is, do we need legislation? Right. We, or and, and if we do, is legislation the incentive that your industry needs? Or do we need what other incentives might work? Jackie, when we talk about my industry, we actually talk about thousands, hundreds of thousands of companies across the globe. So some Indeed. of my members, they don't need the incentives because they're already working on that. Some, they're personally engaged in this action. Others, they don't care at all, maybe in different parts of the world. You can't say industry is one entity. Industry is a global industry. And of 28 billions of garments circulating in the EU, only 20% are made in the EU, so, which is my industry. So uh, do we need incentives beyond legislation? It's possible. We don't say no now. We need solutions. And legislation can play a role in developing solutions. We need to be mindful that there is not one company, there are hundreds of thousands. So it's not that you need to convince one person. If you make legislation, everybody has to comply with legislation, mm. which means we need EU solutions, but we need enforcement, which has never been properly addressed. Yeah. That's the fundamental point. Legislation, you know, you make the law today and tomorrow delivers. It's not so simple. And quick comment, industry did not finance the research. That's something I want to clarify. If you go to the CI cross industry agreement webpage, all reports are public. We did not pay no, only the coffee break, I think, over the um, meetings with the researchers, but we did not finance the research. Thank you. And you make that point about it needs to be EU wide. But we have a number of questions in the audience also pointing to uh, somebody saying, is there a discrepancy in the textile share of emissions between Europe and Asia? You said your research has come from all over the world uh, to the manufacturing of textiles. Somebody else saying, would legislation applying to imports um, be needed to take care of the level playing field issue? And somebody else saying, if Europe acts, but Asia doesn't, then we can't solve this problem. Richard, I see you nodding furiously. Uh, a response on that global approach uh, to this issue. And Frederick and El Eleanor as well. And then I'll come back to Mara too. Richard first. Well, I think Mara's very clearly made the point that we, we do need legislation to try to enforce this as many, many, many different com companies. And I, I don't think that, you know, production in a co countries outside the EU and what they do is an excuse for us in the European Union not doing things responsibly. So, yes, of course, to really tackle the problem on a global scale, we need we need actions at a global scale. But a major buying force of, of the EU could make a really big positive impact in reducing the, the potential for microfiber release. And of course, eventually there becomes a point where the economies of scale are are so great that actually it, it only becomes logical for all producers to make things in a more responsible and sustainable manner. So I think we do need that legislation. I, I looked, for example, you know, to the work on microbeads and there we've seen legislation, uh, which is great. But then I look back and I, and I see that, that the patent on producing microbeads in cosmetics was filed over 50 years ago. And I asked myself the question, you know, did nobody in the industry ever consider where are all these microbeads going? And so I think it's a classic example of why we need to bring the legislation forwards that regrettably we can't we can't rely on the industry and as Mauro said you know there is how would I, I phrase it as a colleague did recently that there's the good the bad and the ugly in any industry and there'll be some that are really striving for the best practice and others that maybe frankly don't care and that's why I think you know the legislation is going to be really really important but I, I don't think we can worry too much that there might be somebody that wiggles out of that we're, yeah. we're, what we've got to do is to move to a better place Thank you. Um, Eleanor and, and Frederic, uh, to this issue of the global perspective on all of this, and if you want to comment on this debate about what dri will drive industry most to, to, to make the changes and how we can support industry in doing that. Uh, Eleanor first, in terms of the sort of things people are doing now. Yes, well, I think, you know, in terms of the global um, aspect, uh, the fact that we need to take into account that that most of the production takes place in emerging economies. I think Mauro and Rich already put it quite well. Um, of course, we need to understand that there will be constraints in terms of the best practices and technologies at the manufacturing stage that you're going to be able to implement in uh, emerging economies. So that will be need, need, needed to be taken into account if, uh, for instance, you're discussing measures such as 
pre-washing of clothing and, and so on. Um, but more broadly, I think, you know, the, the EU has indicated multiple times in the past and, and, and now that they want to be very ambitious in their response to plastics pollutions and, and microplastics pollution. As I said earlier, unintentional releases of microplastics are a complex issue to target. And it will be important that there is a continued continued efforts to close existing knowledge gaps and define harmonized methods to assess and compare the cost effectiveness of different uh, mitigation interventions. Uh, the role of industry is obviously a very important. We heard from uh, Mauro that uh, some industry players have already done a lot to help build the knowledge base and define common methods. Uh, but we also need the rest of the industry to get involved and to find solutions to uh, put in on the market products which shed less microplastics or microplastics which are less toxic for the environment. And for that, we need incentives and regulation from policymakers. Mm, thank you very much. And, and Mauro already pointing there uh, very much to some of the gaps as well in our knowledge. You said and underlined, Mauro, the need for more research in certain areas. Um, Frédéric, from your perspective, a comment to this debate about what really drives industry to, to um, make the change, what can support those front runners, because to get competitive advantage from what they're already doing. Um, and, this, and a comment to this global perspective and, and the fact of, of textile factories being many of them based in Asia. Yes, I think industry needs to be supported because they have a massive challenge to take up. And it's Europe's role to really uh, develop the tool and the strategy uh, for the whole of the, you know, of the crowd to, to follow. Uh, this happens already uh, for single-use plastics, so I see no reason why microplastics couldn't be tackled in the same way. And I also feel that in the single-use plastics directive, a very powerful tool is EPR, so making really uh, manufacturers responsible uh, for the pollution generated also allows to reward those of the manufacturers that are actually doing something on the ground. And uh, I think that's for the best. And that can be quite short term, provided uh, the rules are in place for these systems to be set up. Richard, you want to come in, then I'll come back to Mauro. Yeah, I was wondering if I could would like to go to Mauro and say, cause, I mean, obviously the industry uh, approach to standardizing to standard protocols for, for looking at fiber release is really is really important but I just wanted to ask the question what is industry actually doing to to look at reducing the fiber release itself because it's one thing to have a standard way of counting it and of course ultimately we will need to do that but that in itself won't fix the problem of reducing the emissions and and in a way you can almost start to look at that problem even if you don't have a standard way of counting it you know the the ways of counting things should always indicate the greatest type of release and the smallest type of release so i just wanted to pose the question from an industry perspective what's being done already to actually tackle the issue as well as looking at ways of counting it mara yes thank you again many questions uh let me try to address in the reverse order um on Richard's questions, it did not come from industry, the type of methods, it comes from the researchers. The point is that if you cannot compare solutions, then any claim is good. So the reason why a method is important is not to counting release of microplastic. We don't technically care about that to find the solution. We care about that to find how big the problem is. The method is what you need to compare two different fabrics, two different production methods two different finishing process, for instance. If you don't have a same method applicable easily everywhere, you cannot compare solutions. So everybody says, my solution is better than yours, but who, who is right? So that's why the test methods. And by the way, it's not the industry who say we need a test method, but it was Sapea, the scientist of the Commission, say that uh, really many years ago. So there was one point. Uh, then many other points have been made here. Um, I don't know which one I should prioritize, or if you have a specific question, Jackie, from the floor, I heard about EPR. Um, EPR, yes. we hear a lot about yeah. EPR. Extended producer re responsibility Nothing. saying, what is your position on that? Well, EPR, it's a tax, which is supposed to be used for a certain purpose. Now there have been for more than two years discussion to introduce an EPR in circular economy, to incentivize circular economy and the disposal and dealing with tax of waste, which will increase because in the next three years, we have to be mandatory collected by all over Europe. Um, EPR, it's a tax. 
what you, if it's available or not, depends what you do with that money. Um, how can you put that money, basically? EPR and circular economy, if you have a way to dispose of textile or to recycle textile, then EPR may support that process. If you only need to collect the money to pay the fuel of the trucks which collect textiles, waste, but you don't know what to do with them, EPR does not get you anywhere. And I think the same principle applies maybe to a microplastic. Um, is that what we need now? It, it's a few cents per product more or a few euro, whatever, or do we need to find solution? That is, I think it's a point everybody can reflect with his own, and draw his own conclusions. Can I just ask you all uh, a question which a lot of the audience uh, uh, have asked me to put to you, uh, which is why can't we simply forbid the use of textiles that will shed microplastics over a certain threshold? Uh, Mauro, it, it relates also to whether, what's technically possible. So uh, comment from you first and then from everybody else. Just say above that, they're banned. Well, if you ban textiles which shed microfibers, I think you would buy any, buy, sorry, uh, stop it, any kind of... No, they're saying over a certain threshold, so you would set a limit. Is that possible? Is it doable? I, I frankly don't even know how to answer that question. Um, okay. What is this limit? How would you set a limit? Anything that you use would shed fibers. The jacket I'm wearing now, which is not polyester, it's, it's wool. Fibers will be shed, and it's any anything you do will shed fabric. That that's obviously clear. Uh, to answer the question, I think we need to understand what is the danger that we have from those plastics, so we can assess where to we cut the thresholds. So what is the proportionality of the measures? Um, and uh, again, the best option for us is to find a solution to increase the quality of products to reduce the shedding in the first place. Mm. Thank you, Richard. Um, your your view on this, um, Mara saying, how would you do it uh, in the first place? Um, is it is it an approach? Could it work? I think it could work. I mean, it is back to this question of of a standard method. If you were going to introduce something like that, you would clearly need a, an industry wide standard approach. And I and I absolutely agree. Such an approach is needed. It, it's just, I guess, my concern is that actually, in the meantime, while we're developing an approach. I would like to, to hear that maybe industry are also working on uh, on textiles that will shed less because the, the approach is a way of, of counting it, of standardizing across industries if we were to have a testing house. But, you know, you, you can run the tests as we've done in, in my own lab with, you know, five washing machines, which is fairly low cost to buy. And you soon see which types of garments are shedding more and which are costing less. And where we really need industry collaboration is to say, well, OK, these textiles, these fibers are shedding more. This, this, these might be the explanations. That's where we, we need research in parallel. So we need to design common ways of testing. And if we've got those, yes, I think the kind of legislation you've spoken about, because ultimately there'll have to be a threshold because I think all, all textiles are going to shed. It's, it's inevitable. So we will need such a threshold. I don't think we could find it tomorrow. It's a question of how we work forward. And I think it is about standardizing methods, but I think it's also about getting to the heart of the problem and seeing, well, which textiles, which fibres, which yarns actually shed more quickly. And I suppose I'm trying to say or encourage us that we could be doing that in parallel, I think. We don't need to wait for a testing method in order to improve our understanding of what good practice might look like. And your point about all textiles shedding to a degree made by a number of members of our audience, Frédéric, uh, presumably this is an approach you would welcome. But do you accept that there are some very big challenges and gaps in knowledge that we would need to address first? I believe that there are short term and longer term solutions. Yeah. And uh, I wouldn't go for the threshold as the best solution uh, because we, we need to think long term and uh, really to promote the reuse of garments because uh, the longer you wear a garment, the less it will shed. And uh, that's exactly the, what we, we speak about when we talk about circularity of textile mm -hmm. uh, in our reports. And there has been a very recent report by ECOS, which is a member of the Recent Plastic Alliance. And what they show is really uh, the longer the garment is in use and the less it, it sheds. Uh, so you need to promote reuse uh, and you need to stop about short termism. Thank you very much. Eleanor. Yes. Uh, well, I agree with what, what, what has been said already. I mean, I think in my view, minimum standards are a relevant uh, policy tool to, to, to restrict 
the worst performing products uh, from entering the market and also to potentially encourage producers to make products which are which last longer uh, which are higher quality and which shed less microplastics at the same time i agree with mauro that we need we need to agree on what that threshold would be and that decision needs to be based on science on what the science is telling us that the major risks are whether that's the amount of microfibers their size or uh, their inherent toxicity um just one point maybe that i wanted to jump on uh, but maybe mauro wanted to do that as well i saw on the um trade-offs and synergies between um uh, the life the the extending the lifetime of products and mm -hmm. in general circular economy business practices and microplastics mitigation my understanding is that the science is not so clear so there are actually some um, um, recent papers which are showing that as garments become old, they might actually shed more microfibers. That's also an area where we need to, to do more research and understand better what's what's really happening. Pointing there, very key, uh, uh, Mauro, um, we don't know enough. We don't know the relative trade-offs and benefits. And can I please do comment on that? And also we're moving towards the end. So I just want to squeeze another one in with you because someone asked, what is industry doing to work with manufacturing plants in developing countries? You talked about that value chain approach uh, that you are taking as a sector. Uh, and we've talked about Asia and, and where most of the manufacturing is. How can you give us a little bit more information about how you're working on that? But first, if you want to pick up on Eleanor's point about circular economy. <laughs> well, I mean, um, I think there's a point which brings together comments made by Frederick, Richard and, and Elena, and that's about we want quality of the products. Mm -hmm. Higher quality means better chemicals used, better production, less microfibers and microplastic shed. So at the end of the day, what we want is to increase the quality of the product that everybody uses. And there we are absolutely in favor of that whether it's for circular economy, microplastic, or other matters, that's fine. And focus on production of higher quality, simply for economy of scale and, and productive conditions. So we are in favor of higher quality in the products and higher quality in the market. We can look also at option for legislation for that. All we ask in return is that it's fairly enforced, not to make, we need to resist the temptation of making law just for the sake of making law and to say in the newspaper, we have done legislation. So we need, any legislation has to be enforceable. Tackle the problem and find the solutions. That's the fundamental point. And on the quality, again, there are different businesses. Just go on the streets and see where the longest queues are. That's sometimes what we have to think about it. There are different quality for any products. Which one are the most widely sold on the market? It's also a point of reflection. And Jackie, on your point, um, collaboration across the value chain, indeed, uh, it has to go from all the different steps of the value chain. The importance of design has been mentioned already, I think by Richard before, we fully stand by that. Um, when it comes to the global element, I think this is a difficult point we need to be conscious of. Uh, the, the cosmetic industry, I'm not familiar with that, um, but I believe it's quite smaller in terms of size of the players. And the micro business legislation mentioned by Richard was very successful, just like the automotive industry. You have a handful of producers, which like maybe 20% makes 80% of the products in the market. Textile is the opposite. I guess it's about the most bespoken brands you know, maybe cover 12.5% of the, of the products in the market who makes all the rest. Um, so it has to cover the global value chain approach, any kind of efforts, whether it's research or the legislation. And that's where we need also to collaborate with other countries. And I think the role of OECD is instrumental for that because Europe makes legislation in Europe. OECD can support cooperation, whether it's on breath, on chemicals, on microplastic across the world. So I think this is a very important point as well. Thank you. Before we try and draw some conclusions from the session, did you want to react to that, Eleanor? In terms of your role as an organization? Not really. I think Mauro already uh, put it quite well. Uh, you know, the OECD is doing a lot of work uh, in, in the area of responsible business conduct and due diligence in the garment and footwear sector. And that's one of the platforms where uh, we're trying to engage uh, with uh, emerging economies and taking really a value chain approach to to tackling a wide range of environmental and climate issues and uh, human rights issues. 
Thank you very much. We are almost out of time, but I did want uh, to put you all on the spot a bit just before we finish. Uh, and I'll start as we didn't have them at the beginning. And Frederick and Eleanor, thank you so much uh, for holding the fort uh, and launching such a fascinating discussion before Richard and Mara were able to join us. But I wanted to ask, ask each of you, uh, Richard, I'll start with you, then Mara will go to Frederica and to Eleanor. Of all the issues we've discussed, and we talked with our audience as well in the opinion poll about what we need to do and who needs to do it. For each of you, as uh, the Commission looks at what to do with the focus now, as we said, on unintentionally uh, released microplastics, if each of you had to identify one priority for action that will really deliver an effective response and a workable response on this issue what for each of you is the priority so let me start with richard uh one minute each if you would what's your priority and why so i think we need funding instruments that will bring together industry and environmental scientists i mean in my view we've got clear evidence and consensus that there are problems with plastic in the environment including fibers what we're lacking as has been you know really clearly illustrated by this discussion is clarity on what are the best solutions and where to apply them and i think we'll only get those answers by working together with the industry in order to develop frameworks to support the extended re producer responsibility that's been discussed but we need those funding instruments that will help to bring you know the, the the designers the textile producers together with the environmental scientists that have a better understanding perhaps of the problem there's bringing solution and problem together and i don't think we really have clear funding measures to do, to do that, to help us collaborate, to get to the solutions more quickly. Thank you very much. Mauro, your key priority. Is it money? Is it something else? It's research. Mm. It's research in, to investigate the feasibility and the usability of solution. They can be yeah, same thing. a large scale industry. Uh, the money for research, especially in the European Union, is widely available. Everybody knows the Horizon 2020 programs and the upcoming one. So the funds are there. The interest to research is there, the industry commitment is there, and the research skills are also there, in addition to the environmental scientists. So we have the condition to make it happen. I think we need to invest more on this research. Thank you very much. Frederic, your key priority. Uh, I would say it's really to have a set of coherent measures across Europe. And we have this opportunity coming up with the Sustainable Product Initiative of the EU. So I really want to see microplastics addressed in there. Uh, what we could also ask in terms of focus is really the responsabilization of both producers and consumers. So to make sure the information flows and that the additives that are being used in plastic products are really uh, being uh, disclosed to everyone and along the supply chain. Thank you very much indeed. Eleanor, you have the last word. What is your key priority and why? Perfect. I think a key element for me is the fact that uh, despite the fact that we still have many knowledge gaps in terms of the risks associated with microplastics and the mitigation measures, that should not be a reason to justify uh, delaying intervention. One priority action for me, and here I agree with the other uh, panelists, is that we really need to take stock of all the knowledge that we have on potential mitigation measures, continue to engage with industry and researchers and carry out evaluations for proposed actions. At the same time, there are already measures that can already be introduced or uh, strengthened already today, notably curbing fast fashion trends and promoting the uh, the production of longer lasting uh, products, as well as um, increasing the provision, uh, the sharing of information to consumers as well as industry on best uh, practices that we already have identified today for the manufacturing and use of products. And on that note, it only remains for me to thank all of you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Richard, for not giving up on the technology when it gave up on you. Mauro, it's great to have you. Frederick and Eleanor, thank you so much. Thank you to you in our audience for all your comments and questions. We managed to touch on many, many, many of them. And thank you also for giving us your opinion in the live polls, which contributed to a very rich discussion. So. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, panel, again, and I wish you a very pleasant rest of the day. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.